You guys, before we pray, you guys can go to Genesis chapter 6. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the holy scriptures. Uh, We know that this is the bread of life. This is our spiritual nourishment. We live and breathe by what you have said. Uh, And we hold every word that you have spoken in such high regard. Um, It literally says in in the Bible that you hold uh, your word up above even your own name, uh, which is wild to think about. But you have such honor for your word, and you are the word, Lord. And so to partake of this scripture is literally to partake of you. Um, and so, Jesus, we're just so thankful. We're so grateful for it. And I just pray that tonight uh, you would reveal to us all the things that you want us to know for our own lives. Lord, that you would just cut out the things that are of me or in a, of my own um, just natural mind. And, Lord, you would just, spa- you would just speak through me, straight from the Spirit, Lord. So we just thank you for all that you are, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Uh, Genesis chapter six. For those of you who don't know or if you're new, um, this is kind of a, mm, not a series. I don't like the word series. I try to avoid it, but it kind of is a series. (laughs) Um, uh, But for probably indefinitely, we're just gonna be going through the Bible And we're just going to look at every place that the Bible talks about or mentions blood. Um, And this all stems from a few weeks ago when I spoke at Big Church and spoke on the blood of Jesus. (sighs) Yeah. Um, And by the way, all these messages, if you aren't aware, um, all these messages, we record them and we put them on YouTube a few days after this. And so if you ever have a message that uh, you want to re-listen to, or you're like, ooh, that was good, but I didn't take any notes. Um, it's on YouTube, Restore Youth Culture. Um, you'll see the fancy thumbnails. <laughs> the fancy thumbnails that I make. I get very artistic. Um, but yeah, all, all those messages, they're on, they're on YouTube. But we, so we've been working, you know, just through Genesis, and we're going to go all the way from Genesis through the book of Revelation, however long that may take. Um, I'm assuming it'll take a while. But all the places, all the, I literally have a list on my phone of all the places that the word blood is mentioned in the Bible. Um, and we're just going to go through those. Uh, when we get to Leviticus, we might skim because it says the word blood like a lot in Leviticus, like hundreds of times. Um, and so those ones, we kind of might do a lump, a lump message or a couple lump messages. Um, but today, this is, I think, the third or fourth installment. I don't even know. Third, I mean second, second. Second, third, well, it, it doesn't matter. Not a series, right? <laughs> but we're in Genesis. We are in Genesis chapter six. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Um, and this is the story of Noah, my namesake. Amen. Really? Yeah. It's lit. <laughs> um, yes, yes, it's pretty awesome. But I, I'm just going to read from verse 1. We're actually going to read this whole chapter. It's not a very long chapter, so. Um, yeah, anyway. Genesis 6, starting in verse 1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born of them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. And then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. My version says flesh, but most of your, your Bibles will probably say, for he is flesh and blood. I don't know why the ESV cuts it out. It's dumb. Uh, his days shall be 120 years. And the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark will be 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to the cubit above, and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower and second and third decks, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the bread, breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall, become, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing in all flesh you shall bring two of every sort, of every sort into the ark and keep them alive with you. They shall be made they shall be male and female of the birds according to their kind and the animals according to their kind and every creeping things of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. All right. This is a story that many, many of us have heard, probably in the form of talking vegetables. Um, <laughs> Veggie Tales does a great <laughs> classic. All right. We're not singing the Veggie Tales song right now. Um, <clears throat> but there is actually, and I don't know if many of you realize this, there's actually so much symbolism and foreshadowing in this chapter that looks onward to Jesus. And there you can actually, and we'll, we'll go through it as much as we can. This one might be kind of like a part one and part two within the series because there's actually a lot in here. Um, but this there is so much of the gospel actually displayed in this chapter, and we're going to get into it, and hopefully it'll blow your mind a little bit. Um, but the first thing, we're just going to go through it, uh, not necessarily verse by verse, but we're just going to go through the main points. So, first of all, it's, it starts with a very large topic, and it's a topic that um, I'm probably going to skim over for the sake of I don't know how relevant it is to our lives, and I don't really understand it. So I, I don't want to make any statements that are going to be misleading or just untrue. So I'm just not going to talk about it a lot. But I will tell you, when it, when it starts talking about in the sons of God and the Nephilim and the creatures that are... Uh, having children with the women of earth. Um, there are a variety of theories surrounding what this is, what it means. There are theories that say 
that the, the sons of God are actually just kings of the earth that call themselves sons of God, but they're not really sons of God. They're just, that's just what they call themselves. Uh, there's some theories that it's actually fallen angels that have come down to the earth and decided to uh, inhabit earth with human beings, and they ended up having like half angel, half human babies. Um, there's a whole other thing that the Neph- Nephilim are um, a, just another breed of uh, like we're homo sapiens. They're like homo something else that's not homo sapien. Um, so long story short, a lot of theories, super interesting. I would recommend YouTubing it if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, but the main point that we can draw from those first few verses is that there was a lot of wickedness and there was a lot of evil happening on the earth via these things and throughout just all of humanity. There was a lot of wickedness and a lot of evil taking place. In fact, it was uh, the most evil generation um, that probably up until now the earth has ever seen. Um, And so I want to draw your attention to just this one verse in the midst of this first like four verses that is uh, super, super important for us to make note of, note of. And it says, then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh and blood and his days shall be 120 years. This is a really, really pivotal moment in just the story of humanity. And it's the moment where the Lord said, I will not let my spirit abide with them forever. Um, This was, um, this wasn't the separation because the main separation came from a few chapters earlier, the fall of man that we read about with, you know, Adam and Eve having the first sin and that was the separation. But in this moment, the Lord was actually going to remove his, his spirit from, like, mankind in general. Uh, and in fact, um, up until this point, there's actually a lot of mentions of the Lord speaking, even though they're not in the garden anymore, they're not in the Garden of Eden anymore, but, like, Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve and like their family, like they were like chatting it up with the Lord. Like there's, there's times before, like, so they had some communication with the Lord. And so here he says, I, I'm going to take my spirit from them. Um, and that's actually way more of a tragic thing than we even understand. And I'm hoping that we're going we're gonna to get through it, and I'm going to show you some other scriptures in the Bible that's really going to demonstrate just how tragic that is. But because of the evil and corruption sown in the days of Noah, the Lord removed his spirit. For the Lord cannot and will not dwell among sin. This is the whole reason that uh, Adam and Eve had to be removed from the garden of Eden in the first place, because His presence, the presence of the Lord, cannot be one with or dwell with sin. Um, He will only dwell with that which is perfect. And you might say, well, I'm not perfect, and I get to be in the presence of the Lord. And there is a reason for that, and we'll get there. But just know that the standard of God is he won't dwell with sin. He, He won't. And that's true to this day. God will not dwell with sin. And so he had to, he had to remove his spirit uh, from man at this point. Us as an unclean flesh and blood cannot rightly host God. We are, we are an unclean people of unclean lips. And we cannot host God in it of ourselves. We are only able to host God the Lord now, like as we stand right now, the only reason we're able to host him is because the blood of Jesus has made us clean enough to dwell with him. But it's nothing of our own. It's nothing of of who we are outside of him. 
that allows us to be able to host him and, and actually have his Holy Spirit in us. But that's the first thing I want you to realize is, is the Lord actually had to remove his spirit from mankind. Um, so moving on to verse, n- where, where, where are we going to start here? We'll, we'll look at verse 9 right now. I'm going to skip around a little bit. And so it obviously was going through and just depicting how evil the generation of Noah was, just all the, all the nasty stuff that was going on. And it says, these are the generations of Noah. And Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Noah, guys, is actually a shadow of Jesus. Like, you, we see this in a lot of places throughout the Old Testament. But there are people in the Old Testament And while, yes, they themselves are not perfect, we know Moses wasn't perfect, Noah's not perfect, Abraham's not perfect, but they all give a a type of foreshadowing or they represent something that is true about Christ himself. Because all of the Old Testament, all of the scripture points to him. Everything that we read in this book All is speaking about Jesus, and here is no different. In an evil generation, there was a man who walked in step with God. The only reason Jesus' sacrifice was worthy enough to atone for sin. And the only reason Jesus' sacrifice was worthy enough to wash us clean and actually make us capable of, of communing with God again is because he walked with God in his time on the earth perfectly. Never messed up. Because when we look at Genesis 6 and we see God using language like, I wish I would have never created man. I like, they are so evil. They are so corrupt. I literally wish I didn't even make them. I wish I would have just left it alone, left the earth void. But there was one in the generation. There was one man in that generation, who walked with God and had the ear of God. And it's, that is the the shadowing that's that's pointing to Jesus. But the thing with Jesus is, he wasn't just one man within a generation. He was one man within an existence that walked with God. He was the only one who from the day he was born, when he came and was was birthed in a barn and, and, and swaddled in a manger, from the day that he hung at Calvary, he was perfect, spotless, and blameless. And there's only been one that walked with with God that closely and that perfectly. Because it took that type of perfection to make a way for us. It took that type of perfect, spotless, clean flesh and blood. Because remember what it said, they are are a people of unclean flesh and blood. That's what the, the, the first verse here, verse three. My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh and blood. He is unclean. We are unclean. And so there was only one, and his name was Jesus, and he came, and he was perfectly clean. He was perfectly spotless, and yet was flesh and blood. He was the only one to do it perfectly. Noah walked with God. That is a shadow of Jesus. And I want you to notice the other thing, too, in this this verse 3, when God's saying that he's going to remove his spirit from mankind. It said, It says, my spirit shall not abide in man forever. That word abide is um, 
is a word that's, that's obviously very significant, and we see it used in John chapter 15, and I want to actually go here. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to John, take a little layover over here, and go to John chapter 15, and I want to read verses 5 through 8 in here. And this is Jesus, Jesus himself talking to uh, his disciples. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And whoever abides in me and I in him, he, is, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I want everyone, stop, look at that verse. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Underline it memorize it, highlight it, whatever you got to do. But that is a crucial verse in just the grand scheme of, of Christian theology. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into a fire and burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And that is why, when in Genesis 6, verse 3, when it says that God's going to remove his spirit from him, that's why it's such a tragedy. Because the fact remains, apart from him, we can do nothing. And so for him to remove himself from us is the greatest tragedy. Thank God there's Jesus, though. <laughs> throughout, throughout this series, throughout this um, just study that we're doing about the blood, we're going to be using that phrase a lot, but thank God for Jesus. Because if it's, if it's one thing that the Bible paints a picture of, it's that man, mankind is so weak in itself. Like, we are so not good enough, it's not even funny. Like, in ev at every turn, at every place that the Lord shows extravagant mercy and gives extravagant grace, we extravagantly disobey and walk in rebellion in an extravagant way. We, it's, it's quite amazing how rebellious uh, we are as human beings just by nature. And Jesus, he came he bled, he died, he was buried, he, he rose again. And at his rising again, we officially, there was a new covenant that was officially sealed. And it was a new covenant in his blood because our blood's unclean. Our blood's not worthy. Our blood separates us from God. For they are flesh and blood, therefore I need to remove my spirit from them. I can't abide with them. They're unclean. But Jesus' blood is clean. And so therefore, when we're covered in his blood, it gives us, it's called grace, but grace is supernatural ability to do something we couldn't do ourselves. And so he gives us grace covering us in his blood so that we can dwell with him. Why do you feel the presence of God? It's because he is gracious. And the liquid evidence of his grace is his perfect spotless blood shed for us. But let's go back. We've got a few more minutes here. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6 and let's kind of keep digging in and looking at this. I want you to notice something else. I'm not going to go and read it all verbatim again. But I want you to notice how exact 
the dimensions were to the ark. They're, they're so exact. The Lord's like, you're going to make it this wide exactly. You're going to make it this long exactly. This high exactly. It's going to have exactly three floors. Each are going to be a cubit over one another. Like every th- And when you go and gather the things to bring into the ark, you're going to br- gather two of every creature, every kind of bird, every kind of creeping thing, every kind of mammal. You're going to take you and your sons and your wife and their wives. And he was so detail-oriented and exact about the means to which he was going to save mankind in this evil generation. There was an exact path. And there was only one. And it was his way. You either did it. Noah either built the ark according to to God's dimensions perfectly, or mankind perishes. Those are the only two options. Likewise, Jesus had to live. Jesus didn't just have to come to the earth and live. He had to live a life in exact accordance to the exact dimension that God had ordained him to live without spot, without wrinkle. No detail went overlooked in the life of Jesus. He was perfect and spotless. And like, I, I, I wish I had better words to describe it, but those are the only words that I can use, perfect and spotless. But there's, re- there really, it's true. there's no English word, there's no like language, earthly language that I can use to, to fully depict how perfect and blameless he was. He was what God meant. Jesus is God's only sermon. I, my favorite, one of my favorite preachers, that's, that's his like big punchline that he says, like, Jesus is God the Father's only sermon. The only words we see the Father, God the Father saying in the New Testament is behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's the only thing he says. So if, do you want to know the will of the Father? Cling to Jesus. You want to know what God wants you to look like? Look at Jesus. But he fulfilled every, every prophecy, every word written in this text. The Lord Jesus, in his life on earth, fulfilled it perfectly. Because like the ark in Noah's time, there was only one design to saving. There was only one design to salvation. Jesus is the design of salvation. And there is no design outside of Jesus that leads to salvation. We are saved by the perfectly constructed ark called the life of Jesus. I'm going to read that again. We are saved by the perfectly constructed ark called the life of Jesus. Why do you think communion is so, is so powerful? Because there's, we're, we're becoming part of him. We're actually being hidden within him. It says in, um, I think it's Colossians chapter three, that our lives are hidden in Christ. So think of Christ himself as the ark. And we have to hide our lives within him. And he takes the, the beating of the waves in the wind. He takes the judgment of God upon his back and we hide within him so that we don't have to face it ourselves. He's so exact. He's so exact. Man, there's like so much more I want to get into with this. There's just so much symbolism with this. Um, I think 
I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to wait till the next time I preach. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to rush through this, but okay, let me, let me wrap this up here. I want to end going back to, uh, John chapter 15. I just want to end on this note. Look what we read before. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is it that bears much fruit. Why did Noah's life catch the eye of God in comparison to the rest of his generation? Because Noah abided with God. Noah walked with God. And so that walking in step with his creator caught the eye of God into where he was the only one making you that the Lord actually looked at and was like, I, I don't regret making you. Because the fact of the matter is he regretted making everybody else. <clears throat> and so you can only bear fruit. And when I say bearing, bearing fruit, I feel like this is like a really spiritual phrase that we have value. <laughs> we have, um, what's, a, what's a good word I can use here? Our lives produce something sweet. I'll just put it that way. The only way our lives, if think of our lives as a plant or a, a tree of some sort, the only way our lives produce a sweet fruit is because we are nourished by the word of God. And his word must abide in us. And if his word abides in us, then the fruit of our lives will be sweet. And it, it will actually be fruit. This is what I want us to get from tonight. Apart from him, without walking with him, you can do nothing. Noah walked with God. He was not apart from him. He was, he was with him. That, that opened a lane, a narrow lane, because Noah was the only one. In that age, Noah was the narrow gate. He was the only life, one among thousands, the only life that God looked at and was like, I will let your kind continue because of you and only you. Noah was that, that narrow way in that generation, foreshadowing Jesus for being the narrow way to creation itself, for creation itself, I should say. And apart from him, we can do nothing. And that's why when God actually said he was going to remove his spirit from mankind, that it was such a tragedy. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. Just like the other people in the generation in Noah, they were thrown away like branches that wither. They were thrown into the fire and burned. And if you abide in me and my words abide, abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. In other words, abide in the Lord and you will have the Lord's ear. Just like Noah did. Noah walked with God. Therefore, Noah had God's ear. I feel like... This is a side tangent, um, but I'm going to get into it. <laughs> I feel like I see a lot of people in this day and age um, complaining about unanswered prayers, right? But they don't live a life of obedience. And that just, it doesn't compute. God, God is, it's not like God doesn't want to give you what you're asking for. The problem is you're just not asking for the right things. When we read in Luke 11 about ask whatever you want, it'll be granted to you. The catalyst, or not the catalyst, the, the crux of that was you're living a life yielded to him. And so his wants become your wants. When you walk with God, 
you learn to form yourself to his footsteps. And when you do that, you have his ear. And when you have his ear, then that's when prayers get answered. When you have the ear of God. So there is a direct correspondence between a yielding to the will of God and God answering you when you pray. For apart from him, we can do nothing. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I love this verse too because Jesus is saying, when you, when you ask things of me, when you ask things from me that are of me, in other words, when you have my desires in your heart and you ask for them and I answer them for you, that glorifies my father because now you want what my father wants because my father wants me and you want me. Therefore, you want the same thing. And there's this beautiful just like, like braid of, of wanting and longing between us and Jesus. And when you bear much fruit, you so prove to be my disciples. A mark of a disciple is an obedient life. And there's just, there's just no other way around that. You know, you know you're a disciple of Jesus when you find yourself obeying him even when you don't want to. That's the mark of a disciple. Because it's easy to obey God when it brings you comfort or when it gives you something. But the mark of a disciple is when you obey and it doesn't grant you anything. And that's, that, is, that is the people that we need to be. And let me tell you, I guarantee that's how Noah felt. Can you imagine? A whole generation is going this way. And you're going to be that one guy that goes this way. I'm sure culturally that wasn't comfortable for Noah. I'm sure he didn't love that every second of every day. I'm sure it was uncomfortable at points. But to walk with God meant walking against the, cu the current of that culture. But it was because he went against the grain of culture that he actually had a doorway to salvation. He had a doorway to life. And so I'm going to end it there. Um, we'll do part two of this message in the new year at some point. But let's, let's just kind of ponder that just as we go, as we dismiss today, that our lives have to be hidden in Christ because he is the ark of eternal life. He is, he is the vessel that we join our lives to that takes the brunt of the wind and the waves of God's judgment and we are able to hide within him and have life. So Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for how beautiful you are. I think I, I'm so thankful for your presence and your wisdom that just totally messes with us. Lord, I, I thank you that it, at every turn, you are reminding us about how we can't do it alone, but in the same breath, reminding us that you came and did it for us and you made a way. And you are our provision, Lord. You are our narrow gate. You are the one who is salvation, Lord. And it's in you that we call upon salvation. It's, it's in your name, in your name alone, Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that you would move upon these students to be people that, that show Jesus to the world. Lord, that these, these students, these kids would be people that walk as if their lives are hidden within the ark of your life. And that, and that evidence would be so obvious on their life. 
Lord, and people would be drawn to them. They'd want to know what they have. How do you, in this generation of wickedness and evil and corruption, how do you have a smile on your face? Lord, let that be the question asked of these students, Lord. And I just thank you for who you are, Lord. I thank you for your word. And I just pray that you would, you would continue to speak to us if you have anything more uh, to give us tonight, that you would just uh, remind us of that and just, you would just keep speaking, Lord. So we just thank you for all that you've done for us tonight. We thank you for Calvary. And we thank you for just who you are. And we pray all these things in your mighty matchless name, the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, y'all.